we continue to focus on the many takeaways from the economic survey, whether it's immediate in terms of a revival in growth, are the risks emerging which are being factored in by the bond markets, or slightly longer term trends uh, like the formalization of the Indian economy, risk to Indian agriculture. Uh, so much to talk about. Joining us is a former chief economic advisor, Arvind uh, Virmani, to help us understand what stood out for him. Uh, Dr. Virmani, good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time out for us. Uh, you know, I'm going to start with the sort of mundane, immediate question and then get your thoughts on some of the more interesting data points in the survey. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the survey did a good job of highlighting the revival and risk uh, sentiment that is building up in two asset markets. Uh, one, you know, equity markets factoring in perhaps a revival in growth to about 7.5% next year, uh, and the bond markets factoring in the risks emerging from fiscal slippage and higher oil prices. Uh, that sort of, in some ways, uh, gives you the basic backdrop into uh, which we get in with the budget. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, on the first point, uh, you have to remember that the advance estimate actually gave 6.5 uh, uh, average uh, uh, GDP growth for the current year. And some of us, including myself, had said that uh, because of the mechanical way in which uh, this advance estimate is calculated, uh, I would stick with my uh, growth forecast of 6.75 percent. Everybody else kind of withdrew even from their 6.7 forecast. So, uh, this uh, economic survey uh, clearly uh, based on uh, more uh, available data, uh, uh, which was obviously not there at the advance estimate time, uh, reaffirms that there is a good possibility of 6.75 percent growth. Uh, the importance of that is that the second half, uh, that can only happen if the second half growth is 7.5 percent. Uh, and if uh, so, so they uh, if that happens, so if you have the 6.75 percent, uh, getting 7 to 7.5 percent for uh, next year uh, should not be a problem, even factoring in the risk factors uh, which you have mentioned and, and the others which have been considered in the survey, uh, because that margin is already there in the 7 to 7.5 percent growth. Because normally, uh, you know, if we had not gone through all this turmoil recently. Uh, we would have said, okay, we've attained 7.5, then perhaps uh, uh, the, the, the next uh, year's growth rate, which I may actually still by March uh, uh, get to, is that 7.5 plus minus 0.5 is a, a better forecast. But in any case, uh, uh, what they have given is a cautious forecast in the light of what I have just said, the 7 to 7.5 percent. Uh, Dr. Virmani, what about the fiscal risk? Do you think the bond market is overstating? Because see, if you get 7, 7.5% 7 growth uh, and you average about 5% you know, inflation, which is what is being expected, you have 12% nominal growth. So there would be some buoyancy in tax revenues, even not accounting for, you know, possible impacts of GST, etc. Uh, is the bond market sort of overstating this fiscal risk issue? Are you talking about current? Next you are year. talking about the next year or next the current year? year? Next year, sir. If you do 7-7.5% 7, 7 growth and 5% yeah, okay. inflation, nominal is 12%, right? Right, right. Right, right. So, right, right. so, uh, so the thing is that I, uh, I have noticed a tendency that uh, when we talk about oil prices and, and commodity prices, uh, everybody focuses on the negative side, which is obvious, uh, which is the uh, fact that, uh, you know, if you get a full pass-through, then it obviously uh, affects uh, consumer uh, expenditures because it kind of acts like a, the simplest way I explain to the public is it's like a tax uh, whose proceeds go abroad. Uh, so it uh, lowers the net income, the effective income of the consumer. Uh, on the other hand, traditionally, uh, uh, before the complete decontrol of diesel and, and uh, uh, petrol, traditionally the government absorbed some of it. So we think of fiscal consequences. Uh, but people forget uh, that uh, the oil price rise has uh, many other effects. Uh, the first one is general inflation, uh, which means that the normal GDP, exactly what you've said, the nominal GDP will be higher, the, the revenues will be higher. So that is one effect. The second effect is it raises the uh, incomes of the, uh, of the oil uh, exporters. And traditionally, that has two effects. One is that our demand for exports from these countries goes up and the remittances tend to go up. Now, I'm not saying everything will play out as it has uh, historically, but there are many uh, other effects which arise from oil prices, not just the immediate effect. So, given all these uh, uh, effects, 
uh, I am much less pop, uh, uh, pessimistic of the, uh, the overall effect than many people seem to be. And part of the difference is what uh, the CEA said that he is taking the 12 percent uh, uh, oil increase uh, uh, next year over the current which the IMF has projected rather than some other estimates I have heard uh, uh, on TV uh, of various analysts of 20 percent. Uh, so, that is uh, one issue. Now, the second issue as you said is the, uh, the fiscal deficit. Uh, I think there is uh, uh, you know uh, the, the, uh, the government has uh, a hard and uh, earned reputation for uh, for a credible uh, uh, credibly being on the fiscal trend so i do not think that they will easily give it up and uh, uh, the opportunity is there uh, firstly uh, uh, the revenue uh, uh, buoyancy will come into play uh, quite exactly what you said that all the effects of gst are uh, uh, over uh, we have already seen a pretty uh, strong uh, if we go by the 12% increase in GST revenues which the CA has said uh, and take the 10.5 percent nominal growth in GDP that is a buoyancy well over 1 percent and historically and I have done this analysis myself many times uh, the, the indirect tax revenue of the government have generally shown a, a buoyancy of less than 1 percent. So, that uh, shows you that uh, even now right now. Uh, uh, the GST is producing more revenues and this will become even more prominent uh, as growth uh, recovers. So, uh, uh, I am uh, uh, you know on the optimistic side uh, of this uh, debate that I think the government will try very hard to stick to the fiscal uh, targets. Uh, Mr. Vimani, good morning. This is Menika here. Let me ask you a related question on, uh, you know, some of the data that s sort of give us some insights on both an expanding taxpayer base uh, and uh, some degree of stability in the GST revenue numbers. And I'd like your view on that. I think first, the economic survey suggested that about 18 lakh new direct taxpayers have been added uh, to the tax net. Uh, and even though their incomes are at about two and a half lakh uh, rupees a year, which still keeps them out of the sort of the tax paying fraternity, they have been added to the direct taxpayer net. And on the GST front, they said another 34 lakh new taxpayers have come into the indirect tax net. What do you make of these numbers and do you believe that we finally made progress in being able to expand substantially or meaningfully the taxpayer net in India? Uh, that's question number one. And then my second question to you is on what you make of the GST revenue collection so far. Uh, so, uh, the answer, uh, the simple answer to the first question is yes, uh, but uh, let me remind uh, your viewers that there has been a whole host of uh, anti-corruption, uh, anti-tax evasion measures uh, from uh, since 2014 or so, uh, which culminated in the demonetization. Immediately after the demonetization, within a week I wrote a uh, comprehensive analysis and one of the things I expected uh, uh, to happen was an increase in uh, you know what we conveniently call uh, voluntary compliance, but you know obviously it depends on the structure of taxes, etc., uh, and the anti-tax measures. Uh, so, uh, so the fact that more uh, uh, so both demonetization on direct taxes and and the GST, of course, the whole concept of the GST, the value-added chain, etc., uh, uh, was was is designed to to increase compliance. So. Yeah, I'm, it, it's, uh, uh, so, both those forecasts in a way uh, are beginning to come true. Now, you are quite right that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the, the initial, the people who are really out of, you know, the, the people who are, uh, have high incomes uh, are very visible. So, they are not the ones who are out of the net. So, there uh, the issue is of increasing compliance. Uh, but when we talk about a small proportion of taxpayers on the tax net, it's really uh, at the start uh, because once they come into it, uh, you will get the buoyancy effects. You know, as income increases, your taxes will go up by more than they would have otherwise. So it's really, uh, you know, uh, the the sustained increase in taxes happen when everybody uh, who who is a potential taxpayer is in the tax net. So I'm very encouraged. In fact, that's the first clear evidence. Uh, that the tax effects of both uh, uh, the demortization and the GST are, are coming in. So, it is a confirmation, the first uh, hard confirmation of what we have been saying. Uh, now, as far as uh, GST uh, 
the uh, revenue is concerned i have just indicated i think the pro the errors people made by talking about this 90000 or whatever it was per month was that they were not uh, looking they were not applying seasonality they they assumed uh, that's an average which will happen every month so but we know again from one's analysis uh, from long time and i don't know how much uh, that has changed the seasonality but there used to be uh, a lower tax collection at you know if you divide into two half years the full year uh, generally at the end of the half year the taxes uh, revenues used to pick up and slow down at the beginning of the year so th those effects if you take account of uh, um, uh, which uh, the ca the the economic survey has done is showing you you already got a 12% uh, increase you know for the full year and and so again uh, that is confirming what many of us had said that the gst would have a positive effect but let me uh, give you one implication one implication of that is uh, that uh, uh, the gst council i think will now be encouraged to simplify and remove some of the very high rates which many of us objected to that you know all kinds of commodities and services were put in the 28% which shouldn't be 28% should be uh, about a dozen or so uh, very high uh, uh, revenue items uh, that's all so i i'm hopeful that they will be encouraged to simplify the system much further uh, along the lines which somebody like us we you know we, who have worked on it for 15 20 years would have recommended in the first place but better late than never uh, so so that is the positive aspect of it and if that happens we will see further buoyancy fair enough sir i just want to ask you one more question on the tax bit and trying to correlate what the economic survey lays out uh, with what the budget exercise will be on thursday morning or thursday afternoon do you expect the finance minister or do you expect to hear from the finance minister more aggressive tax targets so we should we prepare ourselves for more than anticipated increase in expenditure on the back of higher tax targets uh, based on what you have just explained thanks to direct and indirect tax buoyancy uh, as a result of which you know we believe that the public expenditure pillar in this economy will probably continue as is or get only stronger even in this last year of this government yeah yes i think uh, if they are uh, uh, so it's conditional i would say that yes if the uh, deficit uh, trend the targets uh, are maintained then uh, they they may be more aggressive uh, both uh, uh, disinvestment uh, and uh, more aggressive uh, 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 expenditures but you know uh, the the pm has already given a hint uh, that there won't be uh, a lot of uh, arbitrary expenditures there may be you know some of the schemes which they have introduced maybe one or two other uh, uh, schemes for uh, directed at the rural rural or agricultural sector uh, we could see uh, uh, more expenditure uh, outlays uh, but you know uh, my test of if people have talked about populism uh, you know what i uh, say is that uh, you know every government has a few things which one could call uh, populism but as long as they are kept uh, below 10 15% uh, which i have seen as kind of the average uh, of the past you know so many uh, decades uh, I, it does not disturb me and second uh, element is that generally one time subsidies uh, are, are less dangerous than than schemes, uh, you know, useless schemes which which don't, uh, which are not effective, which have high leakages and and so on. So what I would be hoping for is is that uh, a welfare reform, which I have just written written about recently with uh, Dr. Bhalla, uh, would be uh, you know which which would be welcome in a sense that if you reform uh, all the subsidies and welfare measures and integrate them. Uh, then I don't think anybody would object uh, to an increase, you know, some increase or even a, a significant increase in expenditures on that. Uh, if we can all be assured that they will, uh, uh, they'll be sp uh, spent effectively and efficiently uh, without excessive leakages. Yeah, well, that's a tall task, sir, for most governments. Uh, one final question on the tax front. Do you think, given what you have just described as the desire to maintain fiscal prudence, uh, as the buoyancy in tax revenue and maybe more aggressive uh, disinvestment targets, that the government will find itself room to cut the corporate tax headline rate from 30% to the promised 25% for all corporations and not just for the very small corporations that they had extended this to last year? 
Well, before I answer that, I don't agree with you. It's not a tall order I have given. We have given okay. in writing a, a way to do that uh, more efficient and effective. Anyway, so on the co corporate tax, yes, definitely, uh, because it's a commitment of the first budget, if I remember, of the finance minister, he had promised that corporate tax rates uh, would be brought down to 25%. So I expect that to, to happen. Uh, what may or may not happen is that part of that was to be an elimination of exemptions and deductions along with that 25 percent re reduction. I think that 25 percent rate is likely. Uh, how many exemptions and deductions are eliminated, I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, earlier he had said he would try to eliminate uh, most of them, but that may not happen. Uh, Dr. Virmani, I uh, just uh, you know, want your thoughts on uh, one chapter where uh, the economic survey talks about the decline in the investment rate and in the savings rate. Uh, there were a couple of interesting takeaways, I thought, from that. One, uh, that you know, perhaps we shouldn't take for granted that we'll go back to the 2007 kind of levels on the investment rate and on the savings rate because that may have been an outlier. Uh, and two, uh, you know, the talk uh, that it, the rebound from a balance sheet recession or balance sheet investment decline uh, would be very, very excruciatingly slow. Uh, what did you take away from that, Dr. Virmani, if anything? Yeah, so on the first one, I have written, uh, uh, you know, on the post-GFC, the global financial crisis, I've repeatedly written and talked about whether it's the US, China or India, is that uh, uh, the, 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 there is an excess capacity uh, in global uh, sectors and part of the implication, for example, metals, we've been, I'm sure you have been discussing uh, in the stock uh, market con uh, context for the last three, four years, those are capital intensive sectors. So, so even a, a, a return to normalcy uh, means that uh, there, there are still excess capacities in this very uh, capital intensive sectors because of China. China uh, is not a market economy, it keeps investing uh, even if returns are very low. So for the rest of us, I think there will be uh, less capital intensive investment, which means uh, that those high levels will not return even uh, with normalcy because more investment will be uh, diverted away from those very capital intensive sectors. Uh, unless of course uh, the new digital sectors like Bitcoin etc. are also very capital intensive which is possible. So I, I'm not uh, you know uh, an expert on uh, Bitcoin so I don't know uh, exactly what the capital intensity is. Uh, but uh, at least for the next uh, three, four years, I, I think that uh, one should not expect a return to those very high uh, 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 investment levels. Uh, sorry, what was your second part of your question? Just that, sir, uh, I mean, you know, the uh, climb back up uh, in India's case from a balance sheet driven investment slowdown may be very slow. I think the economic ah, right, survey right. throws out some right. numbers. Right, the, the return, the double, uh, the right, right, the twin balance sheet problem. Yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, that is historical experience. Uh, uh, you know, so I think the CA ad, um, uh, admitted in, I think, in his press conference that perhaps he, 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 he didn't pay as much attention to this problem in the beginning. And I must admit that I also fall in the, the same camp. Uh, in fact, uh, in 2014, when people had suggested, I had uh, also agreed that this problem needs to be solved uh, uh, urgently. But then in 15, or so we kind of got diverted and, and stopped paying attention uh, to the issue. So uh, the thing is, if it had been solved uh, earlier in 2014-15, uh, it would have gradually been in a position now uh, when the recovery in, is in place. So yes, uh, these things take a little bit of time uh, to get going, but uh, hopefully it will be enough. Uh, uh, <coughs> the credit growth uh, will revive enough uh, to uh, to get the 7 to 7.5 uh, percent growth, which, which as I have said, it should not be very difficult. But getting to a higher level, uh, you know, of the order of 7.5 to 8 uh, may have to, may be a little slower because of this particular problem. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rani, if I can just ask you one last question. There are several other interesting, noteworthy data points in the economic survey, whether it has to do with the judicial logjam and the issue of pendency, which we've discussed for many years in this country, and the amount of tax revenue that's potentially locked up in cases, or it has to do with some very curious commentary on equity risk premium uh, in the very first chapter, where I think the economic survey comments on what it thinks or what we could potentially surmise it to believe and over 
bot market uh, you know there is also uh, a chapter on climate change and the impact on agriculture which could impact agri incomes to the extent of 25% in the years to come uh, what if these stood out to you as one last point that you might want to highlight to our viewers as critical in policy making in the yeah. months to come I think the judicial reform, I think, uh, you know, I have been arguing for it for the last 10, 15, uh, 10 years at least. I wrote it in a paper in 2002, which was published in EPW. Uh, but uh, I, that I was happy that, uh, you know, this whole issue of uh, judicial, legal, police reform is coming because people uh, have traditionally in their minds separated out economics uh, from uh, uh, these sort of uh, issues uh, of personal safety and security. but. You know, the, the, a market structure which we assume depends on the rule of law. You know, the, the kind of free market or democratic market structure is fundamentally based on the rule of law. And I think not enough economists, probably because they are trained in Marxian economics, too many of our economists uh, know Marxist economics more than market economics. Uh, but, uh, but judicial reform, police reform is kind of the foundation on which markets are built, a free and competitive markets. I mean, you can always have some kind of a market, a monopoly. Uh, but uh, uh, so so I was uh, quite happy at that. Uh, the rest of it, I think, is somewhat academic at this stage. Uh, I think he is just laying down markers, uh, which is good to start a discussion, uh, which will play out perhaps over the next five years or or so. So, sir, very briefly, what do you expect from the budget on Thursday then? Well. Uh, 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 I, I, as I said, uh, two things. One, I would expect them to uh, try very hard to stick to the uh, fiscal deficit uh, targets. Uh, two is uh, uh, a little bit of tax reform. You know, the Modi, uh, that Arvind Modi committee uh, mm. has been set up. I don't think there will be a full-fledged report and a, and a big uh, uh, tax reform, but some elements of that uh, should probably seep into, into the direct tax reform. And third, uh, 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 which I mentioned, which you know, some of the proposals, the ways we have suggested of reforming the entire welfare system, you know, and integrating it would have a big, uh, which would be, you know, instead of a populist uh, type of measures, uh, setting up an integrated, uh, uh, integrating the subsidies and having a uni uh, unified welfare system could be a big bang in, uh, in political and economic terms. So, so I'm quite hopeful that something along those lines. Uh, may at least be spelt out uh, in the finance minister's uh, uh, speech. Arvind Virmani, thank you so much for joining us this morning, sir, and for those insights, not just into the economic survey, but what to expect from Budget 2018.